if you give somebody a, a drug that transiently increases dopamine, works better if you also transiently increase acetylcholine or something like that as well. But for the next hours, you know, one to four hours, the neuroplasticity is scaled up, right? It takes many fewer trials or many fewer cognitive behavioral therapy sessions. This has only been done a few times or many fewer learning sessions to create a permanent shift in the neurology such that- Okay, so does, okay, so does that mean that if you believe when you are at the outset of a task that you're doing something important, so you're approaching a valued goal and, you're in, and you have a lot of anticipation as a consequence of that, does that mean that you put yourself in a neurochemical state that facilitates learning? Absolutely, without question. So if you believe yes. what you're doing is important, if you truly believe that because it's related to an important goal and it's a pathway forward, then that's going to transform into a manifestation of neuroplasticity. Absolutely, and every time I hear about the sort of you uh-huh. know, woo uh-huh. statements about the secret or manifesting or intention, all of that is yep. really, yep. it's capturing a fundamental principle of the way that our neurology works, which is that the prefrontal cortex as a rule setting, but flexible rule setting machine that taps into the dopamine system can absolutely adopt new rules for reward release in the brain. Again, there's basically only one reward system. There's also serotonin system, as you know, but the dopamine system is the major yeah. currency of reward. So much so that, for instance, everyone knows that food is rewarding. We anticipate food, we eat a delicious steak uh, or something, and we are, feel rewarded. However, if you are somebody who can attach thoughts such as fasting is good for me, I'm going to do intermittent fasting or I'm not going to eat those foods and therefore I'm going to attach my thinking to the rewards that will come with better health, better aesthetics, etc. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, dopamine yeah. system responds. It's not just a belief in a narrative. It's a, it's a real response. And what actually starts to happen is that people start to enjoy the foods that they, that they are restricting themselves to more. There are actually beautiful data on this from my colleague, Ali Crumbs, laboratory at Stanford, that if you believe a food is nutritious and good for you, it actually has better impact on your physiology. Of course, there are the rules of physiology and nutrition that still apply, right? You can't tell yourself that the garbage is good for you, right? But, But there's a significant scaling up of the positive response that's associated with dopamine and hormonal cascades, which we can talk about in a moment. In the same way, if one adopts a a sort of a Carol Dweckian growth mindset approach, okay, it's not about receiving the reward that the more, the more strain I feel, the more effort that I'm putting in, the closer I'm getting to my goal, that over time will become a rewarding state such that one will pursue states of, of reach. Yeah, well, it should be also proportional to the magnitude of the goal. That's right. Right, and so, so this is, I think, why people are so obsessed in some sense with the search for fundamental meaning. It's because you want to be able to associate. So imagine, I, I, this is a good story. So you can imagine two people laying bricks. They're building a gigantic wall. And the one person thinks, oh my God, you know, this wall is going to take 100,000 bricks and I'm laying one at a time and I'm wasting my life away, trivially adding to this gigantic brick wall. And what am I doing? This is absolutely miserable, brick by brick. And the other person thinks, Uh, in 300 years, this is going to be a cathedral. And so the person in the second state is doing exactly the same thing at a local level, laying bricks, but each brick is related to a very high goal. And that means the reward that's attendant upon the laying of the brick is proportional to the goal, to the, what, what, to the aim of the, of the entire behavioral process. And so It seems to me, so if you're aimless and and goalless, and I know you've done some work on goal setting, if you're aimless and goalless, then you can't elicit any positive emotion. And if your goals are fragmented, which is also what happens if you're aimless or your goals lack unity, if your goals are fragmented, then no given behavioral manifestation can elicit any dopaminergic reward because it's not a step forward to anything desirable. And so there's no positive emotion. And so you can't learn. Well, according to your according to your account, I didn't know that. See, I didn't know that when you put yourself in a state of apprehension in relationship to a valued goal, that your neuroplasticity improves and you can learn better. That's very, very cool. So, because, you know, I just developed this app for writing called Essay. And one of the things we do, we tell people that when they sit down to write an essay, the most important thing you have to do is you have to have a question in mind that you regard finding the answer to as worthwhile. Otherwise, the whole exercise is a lie. So even if you're assigned a topic, you have to find something within the topic that grips you 
and provides you with the motivation that's appropriate to move forward with the essay, with the attempt. And it is a lie otherwise. You're wasting your words. You're, you're, you're engaging in futile activity. And you're going to write something dull and terrible and it's going to frustrate you and bore you while you're doing it. And that's because your own nervous system is telling you that you're participating in something that you have no belief in. And so, but if you do, if you're gripped by the questions, like, God, I really want to answer this question. It's like, well, you're in a perfect condition to begin to write an intelligible essay because you actually want the answer. And then the writing exercise is going to be gripping because you're grappling with a real mystery. And, that, and that's so cool if, if doing that also puts you in a state where you're much more likely to learn, which makes sense, right? Because if you're doing something important and you seem to be moving forward, that's a really good time to learn. Neurophysiologically, that would make, or evolutionarily, that would make perfect sense. Absolutely. You know, the, the system, the dopaminergic system that we're talking about, anticipation and then action and reward, or in some cases, no reward, right? And the, the ability to persist toward a goal regardless is a generalizable system. Uh, you know, I, you had that chapter about, you know, get, get your room in order, right? Get your, your belongings in order. This is, I think, very relevant right now. Even though it's important to have higher goals and lofty goals, the dopamine system is an incredible system because it is, it is depletable and yet it's also renewable and it is self-amplifying. What I mean by that is, let's say that I'm somebody who doesn't know what I'm working toward. I don't have a specific goal or question. By completing even what seem like menial tasks, like making myself a cup of coffee, drinking it, cleaning up completely, drying the cup and putting yeah. it back in the cupboard, what happens is if even if you make that seemingly trivial goal the goal, in addition to making the kitchen look nicer, it completes a circuit. It closes the dopaminergic yes. circuit. And when dopamine is released, and it will be, maybe not to the same extent as publishing a novel, but to some extent, dopamine amplifies our ability to think into the future, to make additional yeah. plans that are unrelated to what you just did, and it in literally increases confidence and energy. Yeah. Why? Well, for the following reason. We all think about caloric energy, but what most people are never taught, you know, and if I had 10 things I could teach people, one of them would be adrenaline, epinephrine, is neural energy. It's your ability to get up and go. It's the thing that makes you jittery when you're a little nervous, but it's also what allows you to move forward, to go out for a run, to pursue any goal, cognitive or physical, etc. Epinephrine, which is also adrenaline, those are the same thing, is literally mm -hmm. manufactured from the molecule dopamine. If you look at the biochemical cascade, it is dopamine is converted into adrenaline, which is the basis of all energy, all neural energy. Right, right. And so, right. including thinking. And so if one is not in a place of being able to uh, set their goal on a particular lofty goal, a graduate degree, a book, et cetera, yet, the way one gets to that is by completing things mm -hmm. in their immediate environment from start to finish and closing the dopaminergic loop. Those are at least micro narratives. That's right. So they're not integrated across a long span of time, but they're not nothing. And so one of the things, well, I did write about this in my first book, particularly about putting your house in perfect order. It's like, well, if, you, if you're lost, one of the things you can do is look around and see what direction you could take locally, is fix something. And I used to tell my clients, this is a very good thing to know. Find something that you could do that would make things better that you would do. And there's a humility in that too, because especially if you're in a low energy state, it's like, oh my God, you know, I don't have enough energy to make dinner. It's like, do you have enough energy to put a fork on the table? And sometimes people are so depressed that that's really all they can do. It's like, can you take, can you take a small step forward, no matter how small that is? And so that's, I didn't, see, I knew that adrenaline was a byproduct down the biochemical chain from dopamine, but I didn't get the significance of that fully. So basically what you're saying is that if you implement a micro routine, even something like washing a cup and putting it back in the shelf, and you know that's a good thing because you have a shelf and there's cups on it, you've already decided that's an appropriate way to live is to have your coffee cups on a shelf. If you go ahead with cleaning out the cup and putting it on the shelf, then you've taken steps towards a, a valuable micro goal. You get a dopamine kick from that, that transforms itself into adrenaline and energizes you. That's partly the reason that it has an antidepressant effect. That's right, and then you can lean into another behavior. I mean, some of the, the more successful classes of antidepressants, again, not for everybody, are the ones of the dopaminergic, uh, adrenalinergic 
uh, variety, right? Things like a right. prior own as opposed to, you know, there's a lot of debate about SSRIs. They tap into a different system. You asked about gene expression changes. There's neuroplasticity, which is on the short scale. Completion of an even trivial task like the putting away of the cup will give you more dopamine, which gives you more adrenaline, which in this analogy of either being back on one's heels, flat-footed or forward center of mass, regardless of where one is starting out, let's say depressed is back on one's heels, it's going to tilt you forward a little bit. And that's a question of what you yeah, little, of what you do yeah, with it. Yeah. So the cognitive appraisal yeah. is critical because again, with the prefrontal cortex being so critical in establishing which of these loops gets repeated, the cognitive appraisal is critical. I'm somebody who can get things done, even if they're small. Now, if you do the cognitive yeah. appraisal I, or or you can you can take another cognitive appraisal there too which is small things are not small precisely for the reason that we just described it's like you might have the cognitive appraisal that doing something local like cleaning up your room is small but it's not obvious at all that that's the case it's not it's not that trivial to put your immediate surroundings in order and it can easily be the stepping stone to putting things in order on a broader scale in fact it's probably the necessary stepping stone to do that and so they might seem small, but they're, they're a step ahead, and ahead is a good direction.